this replica Fokker triplane, it's a 1917 design, uh, Fokker built airplane. Uh, the replica was built by a guy named Dana Narkunis in North Carolina. Dana has built four or five of them. I think this was the fifth Fokker triplane that Dana built. Uh, it's a really good Fokker triplane. I've flown four different ones. This is the fourth one. This is the best flying Fokker triplane I've ever flown. So Dana built it, had built four already. It's a very straight airframe, which is very important. It flies straight. He sold it to a couple guys in Kansas who flew it for just two or three hours, supposedly scared themselves in it. And I think it, I think it was built correctly, but not balanced right. And so they sold it to a guy named Chris Grub in California who had built a Fokker triplane replica, flown it for a while, sold it to a guy in France and was looking for another one. He bought this one. Chris put a lot of work into it. He worked on it for a year and did various little detail things on it. But the biggest thing he did, I think, was to balance it right. There's, there's lead. If you look on the front, there's a starter motor mounted there, but it's empty and full of lead. And then there's a big thing of lead on top of the engine. And Chris made it balance correctly. And so it, it flies. It doesn't take much pressure on the stick to keep it level and straight and everything. It, it just, it's the best flying Fokker triplane replica that I've ever flown. So this is the cockpit. You can see the steel tube structure and the wire bracing. It has these wire bracing uh, bays that go across it. Again, everything is a triangle. You see everything is a triangle. The control stick is a fairly standard, it has a couple of Richthofen mods on it, but it's a fairly standard Fokker control stick. The left side, this was actually the throttle. They wanted it so you could keep both hands on the stick in flight. So the left side moved and actually was the throttle. We have the, on, on the left side of the cockpit is this lever here, originally was a mixture control. We have it hooked up as a throttle because we have a conventional engine on there. And uh, so on the control stick, so your right hand went on this handle, your thumbs, these are the uh, uh, gun levers, left and right, which the, they start in German, they start with the same letter. And you just push these uh, levers here and it pulls on a cable. We don't have all the cables hooked up, but it pulls on a cable and, and actuates the guns and has a, a thing in the back that you can pull on with your hand and pull both of them and actuate them both. Uh, Richthofen, this is a blip switch. Uh, the rotary engines don't throttle down enough to really idle. And so you actually cut the, cut the engine off for a few seconds at a time and slow it down a little bit. It was originally here, but Richthofen wanted it up here. So this is a Richthofen mod, putting the blip switch up on the top. And uh, this is, here's the ammo box. You can see I've got my phone mounted uh, on there, but this aluminum box here is, uh, is where the ammunition was. You can see the ammo belts coming up here. Uh, we've got modern engine instruments here so we can keep track of the engine, but, uh, but this is where the ammunition was kept. They're Spandau machine guns. These are, of course, replicas. This airplane is very authentic from here back. Uh, it has the modern engine. It has the Lycoming 0320 that we talked about. From the firewall back, very, very authentic. John, the owner, John Elliott, the owner, has an original rotary engine to go on it. That we think this winter we're going to have that mounted on it. So the cowling is a little bit deeper this way because it's a flat four Lycoming engine that's mounted in it. So it's a little bit uh, longer than the original rotary engine. But uh, we can still have a fairly authentic cowl with these uh, two holes for cooling in the front. Werner Voss on his airplane had eyebrows painted over it because it looks like eyes in the front. So he had eyebrows painted over it and little eye kind of looking things on his airplane. And uh, another interesting thing uh, looking in here from the front is the landing gear is basically a fourth wing. And the idea was that the airfoil on the landing gear supported the weight of the landing gear. So it was almost like a retractable gear airplane. The, the landing gear supported itself and took care of itself and was separate from, sort of separate from the rest of the airplane. And you'll see the same thing on the D8 and the, uh, uh, the Fokker D7 is the same principle. Tall skinny tires were typical. They didn't have brakes, but they tended to land. The, the airfields weren't very smooth. So you wanted tall tires, so it would roll over the, uh, roll over the bumps and things.
John Elliott, the current owner, always since he was a little kid, like Fokker triplanes, always wanted a Fokker triplane. He grew up, he, he got a career. Uh, he owned a couple of antique airplanes, a, a Kinner Bird, a 1930 fleet, uh, had a Stearman, World War II Stearman trainer biplane, but always wanted a Fokker triplane. He actually, we had talked, he was gonna hire me to build one, and that we ordered the plans, and I actually ordered the tubing to build the fuselage, and then this came up for sale. And he said, ah, I gotta buy that. So uh, that kind of put the kibosh on the project, but he got his Fokker triplane ready to go, ready to fly. And so John went out to California, rented a truck, loaded the airplane on a truck, and they trucked it back to Virginia, where, where we both live. Uh, I put it together for him. Having had triplane experience, he wanted me to test fly it, so I did the test flights. It only had, as I say, maybe three or four hours on it uh, since it was built, and you have to fly 40 hours for the FAA before you can take it anywhere more than 25 miles or whatever radius they give you uh, for your flight test area. And so it needed another, you know, 30 some hours flown off. And so I, I flew most of the hours off and then I checked John out in it, which checking out in as a one seat airplane, you kind of say, you know, there's the fuel shut off, there's the switch, there's this, there's that. Try to do this, try to look at that. You know, it, it's, it's kind of a hard airplane to explain to somebody that wants to fly it you know, it's like going to Europe. You, you can be told about it all you want. When you get there, it's different than you thought. And the same thing with a Fokker triplane. You can tell somebody how to fly it all you want. When you open the throttle, everything's different than you thought it was. People ask if I have heated flying clothes and stuff. I always say if cotton and leather won't keep me warm, it's too cold. And I'm good down to about 32 degrees. With what I have on really right now, I've got good warm gloves. I've got several layers. I've got long johns on, jeans, coveralls, a flannel shirt, a t-shirt, uh, my leather jacket. I'm good to 32 degrees pretty much indefinitely. Uh, I can do 25 degrees maybe for an hour. Uh, you know, below 25, God, it's really tough to fly in an open cockpit below 25 degrees. I've, I've done it, but uh, I always joke about it. I ferry airplanes four or five times a year. People call me with old biplanes. I just flew a Waco biplane from Los Angeles to the Chicago area about two weeks ago. And I, I always laugh about people always call in November. Hey, I've got this biplane. I want, need flown to North Dakota and it's November, you know, thanks a lot. But uh, so I have flown in cold weather and... Uh, you know, if flying hour flights wasn't, hour legs wasn't, it wasn't too bad coming out here. But, uh, but, it's, but it was a big effort. I'm glad we did it. It's like climbing Mount Everest. You get to the top and you're all elated. You're only half done. So still have to go home, you know, still have another 365 miles to fly back home. Hopefully Monday, uh, gonna go back home on Monday. So yeah, the, I'm only half done. And going home, you're not anticipating anything. You're not excited. You just wanna get home. My father grew up in western New York, a very poor family, but aviation nuts. Him and, him and my uncle, his brother, were, were nuts about airplanes. We have pictures of him at Christmas when he was seven, eight years old, holding a model airplane in front of the Christmas tree. Uh, after he died, we, went, we found a big box in the attic, and we're going through it, and we found things that he had done when he was like three or four years old, doodles of airplanes that dad had done in 1930-something. I remember when I was five watching a Fokker D7 fly over and at Rhinebeck. So my uncle got involved at the old Rhinebeck Aerodrome in New York where they do World War I air shows. And so he got my dad involved. This is in the 60s, and I was born in 62. Cole Palin was the guy that founded it and ran it, and uh, he loved giving people opportunities if, he, if they were serious about it. And I, I was telling somebody earlier, the first time I flew a Fokker triplane, I was 20 years old. And I immediately started doing air shows in the Fokker triplane. And I just turned 60, so 40 years I've been flying Fokker triplanes. And it's, I can't believe I'm that old, first of all. But, <laughs> but it's, you know, it's, been, it's been a long time. And, and as I say, pretty much all the opportunities I've had since then are, I can trace back to growing up at Rhinebeck.